As many of you know, when I was a New Age heretic, I was very confused about the angels, and I didn't have a biblical worldview because I hadn't read the whole Bible, and I've repented for that. Uh, Metatron, who is not in the canonical Bible at all, who comes from rabbinical kind of myths and stories and in the Kabbalah, the mystical Judaism, uh, he was someone that I thought that I was really channeling. And you can see here are the cards that I made. Uh, I wrote supposed messages from him in these cards and on books. Again, I'm completely renouncing this work. Um, Metatron, as we're going to find out today, who he is, is spiritually dangerous. So I'm so grateful that the renowned Dr. German, who teaches all types of biblical studies at different seminaries and universities, is here with us. It's such an honor. Thank you, Dr. German, for your time today. Shalom, dear Doreen and all of you friends. It's a great pleasure to see and to be here and to, to share from scripture about a very important topic, which many people have questions about, some have doubts, but it's very important to discuss this in light of God's word. And that's what we would do with God's help. Amen. Yeah, we have to compare everything to scripture. And that's the canonical Bible, not going to the Apocrypha. I know that uh, Metatron is supposedly the prophet Enoch who ascended. And I think that is a, even in one of the books of Enoch, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. There are a few important um, pieces of information about Metatron and just see how uh, the origins of the Metatron theology. So um, actually, I have a short presentation to share entitled The Metatron Heresy Tapping into the Occult. And I want to begin with the words of Paul that he wrote to the church in Colossa in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul proclaims, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And I do believe that we have to heed to the warning of Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. We see that Right in the first century, from the beginning of the first apostolic church, Christians have tapped into the occult. And primarily because most of them were pagans. They were pagans who worship Satan, who worship false spirits. And they were taken captive into spiritual deception. And that's why Paul had to enlighten them and to encourage them to focus on the Lord and to stick to the gospel. And uh, that's why it's so important to discuss the topic of Metatron in light of this warning, because this warning, friends, is a warning for our days. We live in the end times, and we live before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, or in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach. And the Lord warned us so many times throughout the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament against false prophets and false teachers. So the topic of Metatron, I think, is, is, um, is an important one to discuss since if you go to the web, uh, web C, <laughs> we can call it that way, and, and see all, all sorts of teachings that are out there, people get really confused about stuff, about specific question, who is Metatron? Is it biblical or not biblical? Or some even teach that Jesus Christ is Metatron. Is that true? So we'll see that it's not true at all, and we'll discuss this important question in light of scripture. So we'll start with the ancient Jewish sources. Why, we, why do we start with the ancient Jewish sources? Because in the Bible, there is no Metatron. You don't find anywhere in scripture, neither in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, nor in the New Testament, any mention of any angelic being or spiritual power called Metatron. The Bible doesn't even refer to him even once. So we have references to Metatron in ancient Jewish sources. And there Metatron is presented, or at least at some of those sources, he's presented as the lesser God. So basically, the idea of the Metatron gave rise to the theology of the two powers in heaven, 
the two powers in heaven. And interestingly, we find in uh, several Talmudic texts, debates among the rabbis, who is this Metatron? And they had to deal with it in light of uh, actually two theological issues. The first one was the emergence of Christianity. And in light of this, they had to deal with the divinity of Christ, of Yeshua HaMashiach. So that was one issue that they didn't know how to deal with it in light of their, um, of their own version of, uh, monotheist, of uh, the theology of uh, monotheism or the existence of one God, not understanding God's compound unity as it is revealed to us right from Genesis 1 to the end of the book of Revelation, that God is one. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one God, the one true living God, the God of Israel. So they, they had that one important theological issue to deal with. And the second one was uh, the emergence of ancient apocalyptic literature in the Second Temple period in variety of books. For example, the books of Enoch, where we see Metatron. And Metatron plays a very important role in the book of Enoch. So they had to ask themselves, do we really believe in one God or there are two powers in heaven? So how do we treat Metatron? Is he really a lesser God? So that was a real stumbling block to those um, ancient Jewish theologians. Uh, so we know, friends, that the idea, if we examine it in light of scripture, the idea that there is a lesser God, a lesser Yahweh, is totally unbiblical, is pagan and heretical, to be very candid. Why? We see right from the beginning, right from Genesis chapter 1, that Elohim is one of God's names. Elohim means God, or the plural of God's Elohim. Genesis 1.1, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So it's very clear that God is compound unity. And we see the truth about the compound unity that God is not just God the Father, but he has a son, and God is also the Holy Spirit. And th th this truth is already laid out in the Hebrew Bible and later on developed theologically in the writings of the New Testament. So to say that we don't have the essence, the, 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 the triune essence of God in the Old Testament, to say it's not there, it's not true. It's right there. God reveals himself as he is. Father in Hebrew is Av, Son is Ben, and, and the Holy Spirit is Ruach HaKodesh. And we see this truth being so beautifully proclaimed by the Lord Yeshua, by the Lord Jesus, before his ascension to heaven in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28, when he said, Go, teach make disciples from all the nations and baptize them into, in the name of the one God, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, the one name, the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we, we don't have a place in Scripture for a, a bigger God or a primary God and a lesser God. It's a very, very pagan, ancient Near Eastern tradition that is not in Scripture. Uh, let me give you an example of how people uh, actually play with the idea of the lesser God in pseudo-Christian groups. We know, for example, if we take, for example, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that's a proper reading of the Greek text. However, when you go to various false translations of the Bible, for example, the New World Translation produced by the Watchtower Society, known as the JWs or the Jehovah's Witnesses, and you see that the translation of John 1.1 1, 1 is heretical, is misleading. They twist the Bible because in John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus, they say that he's a G, he, Jesus Christ is a small, he's a small God with a small G. But he's not the true one living God. He's not the, so they deny the divinity of Christ. And they place him basically as a, some sort of a lesser God. So basically we see that in modern uh, pseudo-Christian cults like the JWs, and there are many more, they're not 
alone in this camp, we see this false theology, although they don't mention the Metatron, they don't even know who is Metatron, and, and, and most pseudo-Christian cults call, like the Mormons, or the JWs, or the Seventh-day Adventists, I don't think they, they ever, or most of them, they, they never even heard of this word in their life. But the, this, this wrong heretical theology is inherited somewhere in their understanding of God, false understanding of God, friends. So we see that the idea of the Metatron uh, in those ancient Jewish sources uh, is basically the idea that Metatron is a name, is the name of an angelic being or a spirit described in texts like the Babylonian Talmud in those debates between the rabbis, whether it's a heresy or not, the book of Enoch, which I already mentioned, which plays a major role in the Metatron theology of the Second Temple period. And we see that uh, in some of those rabbinic uh, traditions, he sees as the highest angel and the celestial scribe. So that's how me, that's how he's been perceived by those theologians. Okay, and basically takes us again to that to that example that I gave with John one one in the New World Translation, because those false teachers from the Watchtower Society they actually teach that Christ is the, is Michael the Archangel, which is a heresy. Christ is not Michael the Archangel. Christ is not Metatron. So, so, so we see how the, the enemy of our souls, the deceiver, actually um, um, deceives different people, both Jews and pagans and so-called Christians throughout the centuries. So basically, we, are, uh, we see the same heresies, but, but, but in some kind of a new clothing but it's still the same core spirit of the Antichrist, leading people away from the gospel, leading away from the pure uh, teaching of scripture. Interestingly, according to those ancient Jewish sources, after God took Enoch to heaven, and we do know that God took Enoch to heaven, that's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter one, we do believe that's, that's, that is true. He, but the second part of it is not true, that he was transformed into the angel Metatron. So we see that there is another um, very false side to, to, to the Metatron theology, basically saying that a human being, even a saint or, or, or pious man of God from the Old Testament or the New Testament, can be elevated to a divine level and can be transformed into an angelic person. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. It's not a biblical truth. So the Bible is very clear in the book of Genesis that, that, that God took Enoch. Yes and amen. We don't read anywhere that Enoch died. He took him right away. And I believe that Enoch and Elijah, they were prefiguring the future rapture of the church. They were taken alive to be with the Lord in the clouds without passing through the valley of death. However, we see that people actually take the biblical text and since we don't have much information, they add to it. And that is wrong. That's what the Bible says so many times. The Lord warned his people not to add anything in, in, uh, in, uh, to his word, but just to stick to what he has given us in scripture. And according to this ancient metatronic tradition about Enoch, and uh, let me quote this, his, meaning Enoch's, flesh turned to flame, his veins to fire, his eyeballs to flaming torches, and he was placed on a throne next to the throne of glory. And that's what the name Metatron means from Greek, Metatron, near the throne. So, so, so that's where this idea goes from. That's where it derives from. So, and again, we have no biblical tradition on related to Enoch actually elevating him or transforming him into an angel, to any angel or any spirit or, 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 or even any uh, reference to Metatron as a spiritual uh, power. So, Dr. And German, that is so 
fascinating. And I really appreciate you breaking this down. I know you have so much more to share, but I just wanted to kind of interrupt because I recently saw a video about the meaning of Metatron, the throne, um, trying to point to Revelation uh, 5, 6, where it talks about the lamb on the throne saying that that is the lamb on Metatron or Jesus on Metatron. Therefore, Jesus is Yahweh, or therefore Metatron is Yahweh. Metatron is the lamb. And you're saying that Metatron absolutely is not in the canonical Bible and is not in the New Testament or Old Testament. Exactly, exactly, Doreen, right. And if, and if we um, turn to Revelation chapter 5, I just finished teaching a whole series on the book of Revelation in my congregation. We just finished it uh, actually yesterday. Oh, um, perfect, perfect uh, timing. Yeah, Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter. So we went through and, of course, studied this uh, chapter, uh, chapter 5 of Revelation. And the, the whole context here, the topic of chapter 5 is about the scroll and the lamb. There is this heavenly scroll that is open. And there is a lamb. And who is the lamb? The Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the lamb of God. And when we turn to the text itself, let's look even at verse 5, Revelation 5.5. 5. And one of the elders said to me, it's one of the 24 elders, the heavenly elders, weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne, now verse 6, between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So where do we see the Metatron here? Nowhere. It does not exist in scripture. We have here a direct reference to the Lamb. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Yahweh. He is the eternal Son. He is God. And and you being a, a language professor, um, so this video I saw said that it was the old biblical language, Koine Greek, and even said it was the Hebrew, that if you would just translate the to go back to the ancient biblical languages, you would see Metatron in Revelation 5, 6, and you're contending that's not the case. It's not the case. Where do we have it here? We have a reference to the, we, it's written here, and between the, between the throne, the heavenly throne of God, and the four living creatures. And among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. Where can we actually insert some kind of a heavenly figure that is not even mentioned here? Thank you. That's, this is so important. It just sounds like there's a lot of misinformation about Metatron and, uh, and a lot of it is, as you said, it's Babylonian, it's um, twisting scripture, taking the Apocrypha and adding to it. So thank you for sounding this warning. Exactly right. And I also wanted to share with you another warning in relation to this discussion from the Watchman Fellowship. It's a wonderful apologetics ministry. And, uh, and they have a material explaining very well that a new age spirit guide named the Archangel Metatron, helped inspire the Enneagram. And I know that it's a whole different topic about the Enneagram, and you have some yes. wonderful videos about this, Doreen. But, but we do see that occult relation, the relationship, the connection between the whole topic of the Metatron, which is most likely a demon, a yep. false spirit, and who inspired New Agers and inspired the Enneagram which has nothing to do with scripture, which has, which, which has nothing to do with the gospel and not even with uh, the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. And we should have nothing to do with any teachings about Metatron. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's very important to, for us to be aware of it. Yes, that, that it exists. Some people mm -hmm. believe in it, know the origins of this teaching, but we should never embrace it as Bible-believing Christians. We have nothing to do with all those deceitful philosophies that are, that are out there. And that's why we have to heed to that warning of Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, which is so, so timely for us. Yeah, there's another warning in Colossians about not getting puffed up with messages from angels. The worship of angels, which is mentioned in verse 18 of Colossians, 
Let no one disqualify insisting on asceticism on worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his senses, senses mind. So, so we see that the whole context here is Paul's warning, let no one disqualify you. So it's a warning for us today, dear believers, that if we fall into spiritual deception, we might be disqualified in the spiritual sense. We might fall into the trap of a false theology and we might actually tap into the occult even if we without knowing that that's a really good warning and so timely as you said i think um, wasn't the gnostic tradition with angels very popular at the time that colossians was written yes exactly exactly the, the, the gnostics who um whose focus was actually on getting some kind of a spiritual Gnosis, knowledge, mm. supernatural knowledge, very pagan tradition. And, and we see that paganism again in various pseudo-Christian cults today. It's not just the New Age, which is not a non-Christian group from its, from its inception, but all those different uh, pseudo-Christian groups that I, that I mentioned, they've also all, they, they always emphasize the knowledge that they have. The knowledge that they have, which is absolutely knowledge is contrary to the gospel, contrary to scripture, twisting the Old Testament, twisting the New Testament, twisting the, the Bible from the inside out. And their emphasis on knowledge is a marker of a cult, of a false religion. So the Lord is the one who gives us his knowledge, but this knowledge is the word of God. So we have no other source of knowledge apart from scripture. That's the source of knowledge, who God is, and the truth about him, about the gospel, about the kingdom of God, about Israel, about the church. We all have questions. We all want to know more. But here you go. We have the source. We have to be thirsty and hungry for the truth of God and not to replace it with human-made sources, human-made mm. traditions. Amen. And behind those human-made traditions, there are spirits those elemental spirits, the, the spirit of the deceiver, the spirit of the Antichrist. And so one of those spirits or many of the spirits um, identify themselves as Metatron to try to get people's trust, um, people maybe who are not aware of the Bible, uh, and this deceiving spirit might say, hey, I'm in the Bible, and, uh, and then lead people away from Jesus and the gospel. Exactly, exactly. And, and your question actually reminds me of, of Paul's words to the Corinthians, where he says that Satan appears as an angel of light. That's how he comes. And, 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 and also in Galatians chapter 1, do not believe in any other message of the gospel. Even if an angel comes from heaven and brings you something that is contrary to the gospel, let it be accursed and not in my Greek. Yeah, that's, so quite, that's quite a warning. That's, that's quite a strong warning. And we live indeed here in our Western North American Christianity where the new age spirit, the new age uh, antichrist spirit has infiltrated the churches so, so deeply with the so-called prosperity gospel, with pseudo charismatic gifts, which are not from the Holy Spirit, counter spiritual, counter biblical, the spirit of anti-Semitism, and I want really to emphasize this for all of our viewers here, the spirit of anti-Semitism is also it's a very, very strong uh, um, stronghold that, that takes, that, that, that captivates even Christians today. Yeah, I, I mean, it just seems like we all need to just go back to the gospel, doesn't it? I mean, exactly. focus on the cross, focus on Jesus right. as our Lord and Savior and what he did for us. Indeed, amen, amen. And, and always, uh, I'm always encouraged by the word of the Lord where the Lord uh, reminds us very, with, with so much compassion, love and mercy. He tells us, heed to my voice do not listen to other voices in john chapter 6 or right? uh, john chapter 6 for the lord jesus yeshua says i am the good shepherd i am the good shepherd so there are no other shepherds there are no other uh, so-called pastors but one pastor one teacher one gospel one way of salvation and one book from where we find the truth all the truth genesis to revelation Amen. And Jesus is fully God, fully man, the second person of the Holy Trinity. He did not empty his divinity. 
um, the people twisting Philippians 2. And he is not an angel, right? He's not Archangel Michael. He's not Metatron. He is Definitely. God. Definitely. Amen. 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 Just like Jesus proclaimed, I am he so profoundly, so deeply, so um, in, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He is the Lord. He is Yahweh. He is the God of Israel in the flesh. And who, that who is Moses the core wrote of the gospel. He, Moses wrote about him. Yes. Yes, indeed. Exodus chapter 3. Um, is there anything else about the angel cults that we should be aware of or that you want to warn us about? Mm -hmm. I also wanted to uh, mention it. It's, it's, a, it's a topic for another great um, conversation, Doreen. But I do think it's very important for us to mention um, uh, the looming danger of uh, the Kabbalah, yes. uh, Jewish mysticism. And I know it's, it's a whole different topic, but it also relates to the Metatron because, oh, yeah. uh, because uh, in the Kabbalah traditions, you will find, I, I do believe, reference to the Metatron as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, where I, I got my information about Metatron was that he was the first angel guide in the tree of life and we all mm -hmm. believed that that meant that he was there for spiritual neophytes and actual children to help them on their spiritual path of the tree of life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very interesting very interesting so so just a very short word of uh, warning regarding the kabbalah so uh kabbalah from hebrew means reception so basically it has the root kabbal to to receive the word itself, it's not the wrong word, and the root is good, but the tradition of the Kabbalah as it developed throughout Jewish history as um, the ancient, the core of ancient Jewish mysticism is very counter-biblical. It has nothing to do with scripture, and although they do cite verses from the Hebrew Bible, yes, they do cite, they do elaborate on different biblical traditions, but from a very unbiblical pagan perspective and, and 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 why i emphasize this and i'm a self jewish 100 percent jewish and i'm a believer in the lord jesus christ as a messianic believer and um, i do stand for my jewish people and and we do have to be discerning in relation to ancient and medieval jewish literature but this specific type of literature and all the traditions associated associated with the kabbalah are not for the believers they are we have to run from this as from strange fire. Mm -hmm. The strange fire from the book of Leviticus that the priests, the sons of Aaron, offer to the Lord, and we know the result of this. Yeah, so they Kabbalah died. Is, is a type of a spiritual uh, strange fire. Mm -hmm. Strange fire. It's not biblical. It, it, uh, it also contains the teaching of the reincarnation of the soul. It's, in Hebrew, it's known as the Gilgul Neshamot the reincarnation of the soul, which is, again, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. And there is yeah. even a, a, a Kabbalistic curse that is used by the Kabbalistic rabbis in Israel against even the prime ministers. Uh, the, I don't know if you know the story about the prime minister, Ariel Sharon, in Israel, mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, who died several years ago. He was in a coma for a few years as a result of the Pulsa de Nora. That's the Aramaic term for this Kabbalistic curse against him. Mm -hmm. So all those types mm -hmm. of pagan idolatry stuff, idolatrous stuff is, is so, so foreign mm -hmm. to the God of Israel. It's so foreign to the Torah itself. And even in, um, you will find in Judaism, some strands, Jewish strands that oppose to Kabbalah. So it doesn't mean that all Orthodox Jews, they accept and believe in it. But however, you do, you do find many that God is sifted into this. And unfortunately, many Christians even believe that Kabbalah is fine and many Messianic Jews think that Kabbalah is, is, a, is something that there's nothing wrong with it. So I just want to mention this in, in the context That's of so our important. discussion about Metatron. I thank you so much because I got really deceived by the Kabbalah teachings uh, when I was in the New Age and I unfortunately passed it along. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about, if, we, if you have time, I want to circle back. Uh, there's this belief that you can evangelize to Jews by talking about Metatron. Could you discuss that practice, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's a very good question, Doreen. So um, you will find some Messianic Jews, not all, and I'm very, very careful in the way that I articulate this, some Messianic Jews that do believe that it's okay to use the, 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 the book of the Zohar, the book of the Zohar, which means uh, light, the Zohar, um, 
which is the, the, the foundational book of the Kabbalah, the Zohar, that it's okay to use the Zohar in order to make some claims, kind of messianic claims regarding the messiahship of Jesus, of Yeshua, the New Testament, and present the gospel to the Jewish people by using those sources. And there are some even books out there. There are some very popular books written by messianic believers who use the Zohar as their primary source. Wow. And they want to, to, to show and to tell us, okay, look, look here at the text of the Zohar. You have reference to uh, some kind of a compound unity of God theology in the Zohar, that God, that God is more than just God the Father, kind of, kind of the theology. But the issue is that that kind of theology is not what the Bible teaches us. It's a, it's a very serious deviation from the truth of Scripture, what you will find even in the book of Zohar regarding the so-called Kabbalistic version of the compound unity of God. It's not what the Bible says. We have to stick and believe and study Scripture and see that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true living Elohim, the one true living God of Israel, and He's the one, yes. But we have the source. So why should we go to foreign sources which do not teach the truth and try to use it in order to share the gospel with the Jewish people. We have the pure word of God. And I believe that, uh, that we have to use it. However, you will find some that would ob object me and oppose my, my argument and tell, okay, look at Paul. For example, Acts chapter 17, Paul preaching the gospel in Athens to the Greeks. So he quotes, right, from the Greek philosophers. So why can't we quote from the Zohar? It's a very good question. So first of all, there is a difference when you quote from the Zohar as a historical reference, when you want to, when you want to show that, yes, throughout Jewish history and theology, you find different types of, of uh, theology proper, who God is. So if you use it for that purpose as a reference for apologetics, that's one thing. But in order to go back to the Bible, and preach the gospel from scripture. But if you use it in order to make a whole theological claim out of a false theology of God presented in the book of Zohar, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be very, very discerning, wise, praying to God when we use non-biblical sources for evangelism. That's right. Yeah, we don't want to introduce people to demons. That's not sharing the gospel. Exactly, Doreen. Right. And, and there was some verse, I don't have it in front of me, where Paul said we're not to trick people when mm -hmm. we're evangelizing to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Right, right, right. Because you want to bring them to the gospel, you use very foreign spiritual stores, and then you want to bring them to the gospel, to the true yeah. source. You actually confuse them. And afterwards, people would still don't know who to believe, the Bible or the Kabbalah, the yeah. God of Scripture, the God of Israel, or the false image of a God that is presented in that source or in the other sources that we have discussed so far. Absolutely. Trust sharing the gospel. It's the power of God of salvation. Amen. So I'm going to bring on uh, a sister in Christ, a good friend of mine, Tiffany Jessup. You may know her from some of the New Age Christianity groups and such. And, and uh, Tiffany, like me, fell into deception with this spirit that's called Metatron. Uh, you know that I made Metatron cards. Here they are. Um, and you can see that Metatron is always pictured holding this what we call sacred geometry, which means that we believed that this geometrical shape, uh, that we believed it gave you power if you wore it, if you painted it, if you looked at it, and we called it Metatron's cube, um, kind of based on platonic solids. And also there was this belief that it was part of the Merkaba, like a spaceship that would help transport people. I mean, just crazy, crazy beliefs about Metatron. And, and I used to um, kind of pray that he would speak through me and I would channel him. And of course it was the doctrine of demons. It wasn't uh, one of God's angels. Nowhere in the canonical Bible 
not even the Catholic Bible. Nowhere in any Holy Bible is there a mention of Metatron. Metatron is purely from mystical Judaism, and he was in the Kabbalah. He might have been in some Midrash um, as uh, the first angel in the tree of life, taking people through the spiritual path. And, and for that reason, the lore came about that Metatron was here to help uh, children and psychic young people. We used to call them indigos. So just a lot of doctrine about this false spirit Metatron. So Tiffany, thank you for joining me today to talk about your experiences with the false spirit Metatron. Thanks for having me, Doreen. So when did it begin for you that you got involved with Metatron? Well, naturally, as um, deep into the New Age uh, teachings that I was, um, sacred geometry was probably my favorite thing to study. Um, and at first, I didn't know that Metatron was attributed to an angel or any of those things, because at the time I was pretty even antagonistic towards the, um, even the mention of angels and that kind of thing. But as I studied these mystery school writings and teachings of sacred geometry, I became more and more fascinated with um, Metatron's cube and the, like, the, like you said, the plutonic solids and um, even like the writings of um, like some of the older like Plato and Pythagoras and those kinds of things. And then of course it was all associated and rooted in like Egyptian mysticism and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I was eventually given um, some material, some of your old material that talked about uh, Metatron as an angel. Um, and there was, you know, some writings about meditating on Metatron and his wisdom and knowledge because he was said to be, you know, Enoch, I think, that was mm -hmm. descended and then eventually given all the wisdom of the universe, and it was encapsulated in this shape called the Metatron's cube. Um, and from there, that's, that's how I was introduced into Metatron's cube and then Metatron as the alleged angel. That's really interesting, and it makes so much sense. Do you think that it was, you know, like Genesis 3, this desire for like you said, mystery schools, this desire for hidden wisdom, Tiffany? Absolutely. I think that um, through my entire life, um, even from a little kid through my new age years and even until now, my deepest desire is to know the truth, the truth of, you know, the deep things, not just, you know, I, I just can't get through everyday life. Um, taking things at face value. I, I've always wanted to know the deeper things. And I found a lot of um, what I thought was truth in the mystery schools at first, you know, because there was a lot of experience, a lot of, you know, hidden wisdom. And of course it's hidden. So you think you're onto something that nobody else knows. And, but yes, it was definitely rooted in that desire to know the deeper things. That is interesting. And and so you actually got really into sacred geometry. I mean, I did too, but it was more through crystals that were um, shaped like the platonic solids. And I had jewelry with Metatron's cube and clothing and such. And I understand you actually took your, um, your painting work to capture some of the sacred geometry of Metatron. Absolutely. In fact, I'm not an artist. Um, I have not painted before that and I haven't painted since, but there was something profound when I would like, I would paint a background of like just a color or just something spacey and it would be um, blank and I would sit and I would stare and I would meditate and pray to Metatron or whichever of these things I was trying to understand. And I would have like almost these visions. And then from there, to draw sacred geometry, it, it was, I don't know how to explain it, like supernatural almost. I would have these supernatural experiences where I'd have like this information that would be downloaded almost as I was drawing these things. And then for me, it was almost an obsession to paint these things the way that I saw them because I wouldn't see them as just a, you know, on a piece of paper, I would see them as like a, three-dimensional 
object and um, trying to portray that was something that I was almost obsessed by. And I would get very frustrated and angry when I couldn't accomplish what I wanted. So it was definitely a, <laughs> an experience. I can understand. Yeah. Um, when we get involved with these demons, of course, the Bible clearly says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And you and I were definitely deceived. Um, I think it's so interesting how throughout the Bible, it shows that the devil will try to counterfeit what God makes. And in nature, if you look at a ring of a tree, there is a symmetry. You could even call it geometry. And so throughout nature, you can see uh, what the devil mimics with Metatron's cube and this so-called sacred geometry. Absolutely. And since I've been saved, of course, I've come to understand these things as, um, um, you know, geometry is geometry. We can't really deny that it works, that it, that it, that it exists. I mean, it's in everything. Um, but like you said, it's been hijacked by Satan and his demons and people are now worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And I think that's a big deal. Um, and that's, that's definitely, um, what's helped me to understand a lot of the experiences that I had as well, as well as, um, to understand what, what I experienced and looking back in hindsight, I understand that those experiences and that information that, that seemed to be downloaded and just come to me like in a divine way really had no substance. It was, it was like a carrot on a stick. It just left me chasing after more. It wasn't even substantial. I couldn't hold on to it. I couldn't tell you what it even was that I was experiencing. It was, it was fake and it was all just a deception to draw me further and further away from the God of the Bible. Mm, I understand. Um, how did it affect your personal life? I mean, you're a wife, you're a mom. Did this getting tangled up with Metatron and these visions of sacred geometry impact your personal life? Um, they did in, in ways that, um, that are difficult to explain. So I actually drew everybody around me into these things. So I have one painting that I actually had my sister-in-law paint the background to. And I had this, this vision of like a vortex or whatever that I wanted painted, but I couldn't for, I'm not an artist, so I couldn't figure out how to make it work. So I would have my husband do it and my kids would be in on, like I would teach them these things. And my kids now are um, teenagers and they will, they'll talk about, their experiences as kids with the new age mom and some of these things that I would involve them in were terrifying to them. Mm. Um, and it's, it's actually really fascinating to me now to hear their perspective of things. Um, but yeah, it would become almost an obsession um, to, to draw these things. I would be at work and I would just have my compass and colored pencils and I would draw these shapes um, nonstop just, just nonstop. I'd have stacks of these things in my binders and on my desk and I wouldn't pay attention to work. And it was, it was consuming in a not good way. Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> I was the same way with getting messages from Metatron. And, and at one point I was convinced that Metatron and Archangel Michael worked together as kind of twins that had each other strengths and I remember I recorded a podcast about working with Metatron and Michael and and uh, and it's just like you said these constant downloads uh, I think part of it now looking back is the devil tries to keep us busy and distracted so that we won't read the Bible and know the truth absolutely and I think that's interesting they that said that because I had like a vision that was similar where I thought it was like Metatron and um, Raphael uh, so I had this whole vision of this picture and I painted it with this like purple background, which was supposed to represent, I think, Raphael. And mm -hmm. then it, it was the, the medical, the medical, is it called a catechus? I think. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So and the, it, the symbol that he holds with the snake, yeah. the serpent. Yeah. And the wings. The, the, yeah. And it had the wings, but then it had the chakras in it. And then above it had the, the sacred geometry uh, seed of life. And this whole thing was just this 
you know, download, I'm sure from the subjection of like some of these cards and some of the things I had read, but, um, and I actually gifted that to my, my stepmom who, um, has been, um, suffering from Crohn's for the, her whole life. And now I kind of wish that I could be like, Hey, can I have that back? Cause mm-hmm. I know it still hangs on the wall. Mm-hmm. So if you're watching, take it down. <laughs> yes. Take it down. Um, uh, it sounds like, like, it sounds true, Tiffany, like you believe, like I do that the sacred geometry, having it around, and that includes mandalas, right. Um, can yeah. have a, uh, a negative influence. Uh, it can be, I think it can attract spiritual warfare personally. I got rid of all my sacred geometry items. Of course, I got rid of all the cards. My mom still has new age stuff in the house. And my husband has these angel paintings that I don't like in his office. But um, I just found that I couldn't be around them after I was saved. Did you have that experience too? I, I, I actually did. In fact, when we were talking about this video, I thought I would look at some things online or like some of my old books. And I found it to be um, really hard to do. Uh, and they do, they definitely do have an influence that, um, I wouldn't, I don't think we need it as Christians. It's not in the Bible. Um, we, we just shouldn't even be focusing on Mm -hmm. it. Um, That that word focus is interesting because I I think that if you kind of meditate on those sacred geometry shapes, it kind of puts you into a trance which can leave you vulnerable to these demonic visions you were getting and the, the messages that I was getting. It just kind of empties your mind when you, uh, when you get hypnotized by these shapes. Definitely. It's kind of like sweeping the house clean and then you're filling it full of this yeah. demonic influence, which is why we're told to meditate on the word and not the, you know, the things of the world. So I, I definitely think that's in the Bible for a reason. Um, it's a, way to safeguard our minds from the influence of you know Satan and his and his helpers (laughs) oh man what would you say to someone who's watching Tiffany who does have Metatron cards or who has been going into the so-called secret mystery school teachings um I would say you are absolutely missing the point um I truly believe that your heart is seeking for truth and um, I fully um, empathize with that. I understand that desire, that passion, um, but you're missing it. Where you need to look is inside the Bible. Um, read the Bible for yourself, not based on what anybody has told you, what anybody says. And even if you read it to somehow try to prove it wrong, I dare you, read the Bible and see what truths you can find in there. And um, it changed my life in more ways than I could ever explain. And those deep questions that I had from early childhood have all been answered. Not a single one has been left to, if, to mystery. Um, I'm confident and renewed by the word of God. Oh, man, I totally agree. Yeah, um, no matter what you hear some teachers on YouTube say, Metatron is not in the Bible or the Metatron, he sometimes Uh, referred to. Um, There's teachings that he's Jesus. That's absolute blasphemy. Um, Neither neither Archangel Michael nor Metatron are Jesus. Jesus is the second person of the Holy Trinity. He is God. And when he was here on earth, he was fully God and fully man. And he died for us as the perfect sacrifice for the sins that we committed, that we deserve the punishment for. And then he was risen three days later and he now sits at the right hand of God and if you'll read in the Bible if if there's one book you want to read about this read the book of Hebrews even just chapter one of Hebrews and it shows that Jesus is far above the angels and therefore he could not be one of these angels he is God there's a reason why people like the the Masons and the the miss the mystical Kabbalists of um today they they draw they're drawn to these things because it misses the point um if we were supposed to understand these things as holy it would be in the bible and they're not that's right that's a really good point yeah um it's not about experience it's not about mysticism it's not about what's cool or trendy it's about what the bible says that's god's word 
and we yeah, can believe absolutely. it and we can trust it. So Tiffany, how did you find out the truth? How did you realize you were being deceived by the spirit called Metatron? Well, I um, was actually very antagonistic towards Christians, as I've said before, towards the God of the Bible. Um, I had absolutely no desire to know anything about it, but I had a mother who never stopped praying and never stopped uh, having conversations with me. She would ask me the hard things. She would um, genuinely, not rudely, not, not sanctimoniously, just out of complete love and genuine care, she would talk to these, talk to me about the things of the Bible in comparison to the things that I believed. And this went on for years and years and years. And eventually I decided um, that I was going to read the Bible to just prove her wrong once and for all, to just show her that the Bible was nothing but a key to understanding the new age things and truths. And um, man, when I got, I didn't even make it five chapters in the book of Matthew without God grabbing hold of me and um, let me tell you it's it's the the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me in my life you finally found the truth that you were looking for absolutely and when I when I read it I knew it and that doesn't mean that it was easy in the beginning there was I I probably dug my heels in and um, was resisting with every bit of me but um, in the end you can't resist it when you when you when you're genuinely seeking to know the truth he will show you amen tiffany thank you so much for your time really love you and appreciate you so much thank you same with you doreen thank you okay god bless you sis